in the Ukraine world. And uh, I'm very happy that we keep on engaging and inviting top world intellectuals. And today we have Pascal Dutner, who is one of the most famous French philosophers and uh, a big supporter of Ukraine and author of many books. Some of them are translated into Ukrainian, for example, La Tyrannie de la Pénitence, Tyrannia Kreatia, or Le Paradox Amoureux, uh, the Love Paradox. And uh, Pascal is also a novelist, so he is a remarkable combination of conceptual thinking and uh, storytelling. So I really advise to you to read his novels, like the La L'Amour du Prochain, uh, the love of the close one, and then the, the famous uh, novel uh, 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 Bitter Moon. Uh, so, uh, please welcome Pascal here. Please. unpleasant thing is that Pascal is a little bit ill, so uh, we were thinking this morning whether to cancel the event because uh, there is, he has a fever, so we are grateful so much that he decided not to cancel the event. Uh, thank you so much. But we will not have too much time not to make uh, it kind of a, a too difficult, so we have about one hour. And uh, I will make a conversation with Pascal for about 30 minutes and then uh, I give the floor for a conversation with, uh, with you for about 30 minutes. So my first question would be that you are coming to Ukraine. It's not the first time that you come since the full-scale invasion. Why is it important for a French philosopher like you not to stay in Quartier Latin but, to, but to really to go to um, a country which is uh, which is subject, which is target for the Russian very cruel war. So, well, I always traveled a lot in the Eastern country, even during the communist period. I went, I went to USSR, to Russia, I went to Czechoslovakia, I was carrying messages for dissidents. I think I was just a puppet between the, the end of the uh, KGB, because I knew exactly what I had in my, in my uh, pocket. But anyway, I've always had uh, strong ties with the dissidents of Eastern Europe. I met uh, Daniel Sinavsky, and I was in also his son in, in, in Paris, Diego Grand, which maybe you have made. And um, so I think for me, it's, it's a continuation of uh, an anti totalitarian fight of, um, against Russia, which after 15 years of pseudo democracy, led by Hadad Yago, Lake Boy Hilsin, and the settlements of account with Kalashnikov or the oligarchs now has fallen into uh, autocracy for the last 20 years. And uh, strangely, in France, the anti-Putin have been lonely for a very long time, for now 20 years, and even today, many people uh, find a lot of charms to Putin. They say, yes, it's a little rough, but uh, you know, this is the kind of man we need in France. And uh, I think it's a total mistake of analysis. And uh, the day when Ukraine was uh, invaded, February 24th, I was a fabric acid, I was uh, struck. I was in Switzerland with my wife, and I couldn't believe my eyes. And of course, I thought he would, uh, Putin would make it. But he would have to predict the worst to have a view of the future. But uh, I hope that was mistaken. And uh, so for me, it's, uh, it's a good reason to come here and to support Ukraine in France and uh, to support Ukraine, on, especially on television, because you know, writing articles is good, but nobody reads the articles except to convince one. And so on TV, you can touch a lot of people. And that's why I try, we try after uh, this trip to go on television. Now we have a commitment for the next Saturday and then after my return. So we, we are thinking a lot about the Western world here. Uh, and sometimes we see, when we talk about the West, sometimes we hear people in the West that are telling us that the West doesn't exist anymore. 
and people in the West are using a concept like what has sometimes, some time ago, has been the West. Do you think, do you still think that the West exists? Oh yes, of course. It, it mainly exists through the hatred of its enemies. You know, why, how can you understand that? Russia, Iran, Turkey, Turkey is it's a complicated game. China, um, uh, most of the uh, Arab regime hate, hate the, the West so much. It's well because we represent something absolutely new in the history of civilization. A combination of power and conscience of uh, individual democratic right and um, economic prosperity. And uh, those uh, individual rights are uh, unbearable for autocratic regime or theocratic regime. And that is why, uh, of course, there is a combination, an alliance between Putin and, um, and uh, Khamenei, so the head of uh, the Islamic State, and all the terrorist group which uh, uh, Moscow supports, attacks, supports, attacks, and because as you know, Putin is the king of the cynicals. But yes, I, I don't think the West has, has lost any uh, uh, relevance. And uh, you know, in the West, we, we have practiced for so many years the self repentance, self penance that now we even deny to ourselves to exist. No, we do not exist. We do not exist. We're just a shadow of the wall. We are a cloud in the sky. But that's absurd. And at the same time, uh, people try to convey this uh, lazy concept of global south. The global south does not exist. There's nothing like global south. Take, for instance, what happens in the Middle East. Uh, India, Japan, Singapore, many African states, many South American states are supporting Israel. The worst enemy of uh, New Delhi is Peking, Beijing. So Global South is a, a, try, is a kind of resurrection of the old concept of the Third World, which has been very uh, active during the 50s, 60s, 70s. And it's a way to say uh, there are two worlds, the West and the Orient, they and us. And it's, of course, you find a reminiscence of the theory of Huntington, uh, the West and the rest. But uh, even if Huntington was quite insightful about his, um, about his view of the world, I think the rest, a part of the rest, is signing along the West. And you write a lot about this in your book, uh, in your books, uh, saint Blanc, de, de Blanc, Tears of the White Man, and in the Tyranny de la Penitence, the, the Tyranny of Guilt that um, our public, Ukrainian public, knows or will read after, after our discussion. And you actually say this, this the tyranny of penitence, is, uh, the tyranny of guilt, is the self masochism of the Western world upon itself. And it really struck me sometimes. When I, I am in Western Europe and I say, look, Europe is about the reduction of the space of, for violence. And people look at me like a crazy man because they say, okay, you forgot about Nazism, you forgot about colonialism. I say, no, I didn't forget about it. But I think that European civilization is learning on its crimes and is learning on its mistakes. It's not ideal, but, uh, but um, the way that itself is criticizing itself, it gives the language to others to criticize itself. And it's very interesting and very paradoxical and very conflictual. And I do think that the problem of European and American worlds is that, that there is a loss of faith in themselves, what you are saying. Uh, do you think, uh, is it correct, diagnosis? Uh, yes, you're very right. And um, uh, yes, we, we, you know, it's like, it's as if Europe say, I'm remorseful, I'm remorseful, who has a crime which I could repent of? And uh, Europe is ready to uh, take on its shoulders all the problems of the planet, including, of course, the global warming, which is, of course, our fault. Everything is our fault. And not later than this morning in Brussels, maybe you have seen that in the news, a um, um, political commissaire for equality, she's from Mal, said that Europe has invented racism, colonialism, fascism, and so and so. And so and that it should repent forever of these evils. So let's, um, let's uh, 
see things clearly. Uh, how many European countries have been uh, colonized? Eight out of 27. France, England, Germany, Denmark, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, Portugal, and a few of those which I forgot. But Belgium. The Netherlands. Belgium. Belgium. Oh, Netherlands, Belgium, yes. And, and Denmark, but Denmark invaded the uh, Groenland. And so it's about eight, eight countries. We are 27. And the rest of Europe has been colonized. That's exactly, you know, we are totally in pledges. We forget, uh, we don't know history. In fact. We don't care about history. We reduce it to a slogan. And uh, take Eastern Europe has been colonized by the Ottomans, by the Russians, by the Austrians, by the Swedes, uh, by the Poles also. You have been uh, colonized by the Poles. And, um, and uh, it's been colonized until 1989. And of course, this war in Ukraine is a colonial war of a, an ex-master who wants to retrieve his own possessions. So uh, this, uh, the kind of view lacks complexity. And it's so simplistic that uh, you want to, to shrug your shoulders, but you have to explain very plainly and very simply without any anger that, um, of course, we've been colonialists. Of course, we've been uh, slave owners. But uh, let's not forget the, the three slave uh, trade inside Africa. My, my wife is from Africa, so she knows a little bit about that. Uh, oriental uh, slavery, which is still going on nowadays in, in Libya, in some parts of Saudi Arabia, in, in Mauritania. It has been abolished uh, so few years ago that it keeps uh, going on. And of course, the, uh, the transatlantic uh, slave uh, trade. But uh, it seems that uh, as we are Westerners, we, are, we have the duty to repent. And the other uh, don't have to regret anything because they're not us. Whoever is not us is innocent. Whoever is Western is guilty. And so of course we, we try to balance uh, the charge of the guilt between Europe and the United States. So for many years, uh, the United States have carried uh, the heaviest weight. And, uh, but now, with uh, the rise of wokeism, with the rise of wokeism on the campuses, guilt has come to, to the left of the Democratic Party with all these um, terrible phenomena that we, we see nowadays. So, yes, uh, we have to admit that we've made horrible things. But uh, we have also invented the remedies to cure them. And these remedies, as we said before, self-examination, self-criticism. And the first text uh, criticizing uh, colonialism and slavery have been written by, uh, uh, I think it's a Franciscan or a Dominican, uh, Bartolome de las Casas in Mexico, saying that it was horrible to treat Indians like animals. And this is the first writing about uh, the shame of slavery. You don't have such phenomenon in Africa or in, in the Arab world. And it's very important. Human rights were born in Europe and only in Europe, even if you have a, a Hindu emperor called Ashoka, who for centuries before Christ invented something like the human rights, but they were never applied. And I think this is self-contradiction of the European civilization is something that is inaccessible for its enemies, for enemies like, like Russia. So this kind of a schizophrenia, which is which is in fact a good thing, because you have a you have a a killer and, and a person and a savior in the same person, in the same civilization. This bipolarity. Well, we were recently talking to our friends and there was a joke that a symbol of Russia should be not a polar bear, but a bipolar bear. Oh, okay. uh, but this, this self-contradiction is, is a very important, um, important thing in the European civilization. And for example, we see that on Russians, because Russians do not have in their, in their culture this culture of repentance. So they, they commit crime, they erase the memory of the crime, they erase the memory of the victims, and they commit another crime and another crime. And therefore we see that 
In America, you have huge manifestations against the Vietnam War, against the Iraq War, against the Afghanistan War, and you, have, you see no manifestations in Russia against the Afghanistan War or against uh, the invasion of Georgia, the invasion of Ukraine. What do you think? Yes, in, in, I think in 1921, Sigmund Freud made an introduction to a, a novel by Dostoevsky. I don't remember which one, it is a Karamazov of course. And Freud said that it's a very strange way to understand confession in uh, the Orthodox world. Because you commit a crime, you, you go and you repent before with the priest, and then you commit another one again, because you know you will be excused a little after. And those things happen in the Catholic world also, I have to say. But I think it's a very good image. And one of the tragedies of Russia is that this, it has been, alongside with America, the, the victor of, the, of World War II. And so there was no new emperor for communism. There was no uh, judgment for the crime of Stalin, uh, which now allows uh, Putin to uh, praise uh, the little uh, father of the people and to uh, prohibit whoever criticizes Stalin. So um, in all the mental activities, uh, Russia has just forgotten over um, one, which is essential, it's the inner glaze into your own conscience. You know, we have been taught, this is the basis of uh, Greek philosophy and Christian uh, religion, we have been taught from the childhood to look into our own conscience. What did you do wrong today? What did you do good? But for the Russians, they do only good because they are the elect people. They've been, uh, they are the chosen one. And uh, nothing bad can happen in Russia. And if it's bad, it's because it's the fault of the Americans, of the bad capitalism, or the fault of the Ukrainians, or the Poles, or the ex-colonies. We, we don't want to recognize all the benefits they withdrew from the Russian occupation. To continue this topic, uh, but to shift it a little bit, um, my, my teacher in, in France, uh, so the director of my French uh, dissertation, French, uh, French thesis, François Azouli, who um, I met him recently, one year ago, I think, and he told me he's working on a book, how the memory and how the conscience, or European conscience, also about the wars, about the Second World War in particular, shifted from the idea of a hero to the idea of the victim. And uh, uh, so we, instead of praising the heroes, we're rather mourning the victims. And on the one hand, it's very good. And I think uh, the way how Ukrainians also shifted the memory of the Second World War following the European examples, talking more about the victims of the Second World War rather than this uh, Red Army, you know, uh, cult of, of, of Red Army, which was in the Soviet Union. On the one hand, it's good. But on the other hand, it's, it's problematic. We see that in, in Ukraine right now. Because, of course, during the war, uh, it's not only about victims, because there are, sh there, are sh there are people that should fight. You can call them heroes, you call them warriors, you call them whatever. But if you don't people for fighting, uh, you just lose the war. So my question is, uh, is this shift in Europe's 20th century from the idea of a hero, which is, is the basis of the European idea, European values, starting from Achilles to I don't know, to the idea of uh, medieval knights. So you have this warrior image of the warrior at the very bottom of the very basis of European civilization. And now it's shifting towards the idea of victims and, and calling Europe itself a kind of a, a, a bad guy and then you should repent with the victims. On the one hand, it's cool, but on the other hand, it, it leads you to a kind of a impuissance, leads, leads you to a lack of power, what do you think? Or as in, to just summarize my next text, which I gave uh, to my publisher late last Monday. I should be a co-author. <laughs> yes, 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 of course I will add your name. And um, yes, I think that is a big shift after World War II. World War II. And I think, I think it's mainly due to the eruption of the Holocaust in the common mind. And uh, so everyone identified himself with the Jews. And as uh, usual, uh, as soon as a deported Jew became a hero, everyone said, no, I'm the hero, I want to kick them off from this place. So nowadays, everybody wants to take the place of the Jews, 
Palestinian, Muslims, indigenous people, uh, Afro-American people, like that, women, children, and uh, because this, uh, this, this place of the victim is a diversity one, if you can prove that you are a victim, that you have been deprived of a fundamental right, uh, then you have all the rights. Uh, you don't have any more duties, you have all the rights, the world is yours, and you cash the debts that the others owe you. Uh, you know, you're totally un un untouchable. And that's exactly what is happening uh, nowadays uh, in France, but also in other uh, countries, like, uh, like America. And America has uh, pushed the victim um, culture very far, uh, especially with the black community, with the LGBT community. And uh, uh, as I say, you can be a victim from father to son, from mother to daughter. It's a kind of hereditary title. Um, exactly like the refugees in the Middle East are uh, refugees from uh, grandfather to, to grandson. And uh, I don't think this is very sound. And it doesn't make a strong country anyway. And just if you may allow me a small um, remark, in, uh, after November 13th, 2015, after the bomb attacks in uh, Bataclan, and in uh, the streets of uh, Paris, the government uh, proposed to, um, to rise the victims uh, at, at the um, rank of heroes. So he, he proposed to offer them the Legion d'honneur. I don't know if you have something like this in, in, in Ukraine, but I guess you have one, which is the highest rank of someone who has accomplished an act of courage. And um, there were strong protests because they say, being a victim, of course, is very tragic, but it means that you're passive. A hero is active. He goes to save people, he, he fights for all those people's lives, and, and so finally the government changes his mind and then uh, uh, takes his measure. But you know, it's, it's to prove that uh, to victimize oneself is to um, raise yourself on a pedestal from where no one in principle could topple you down. That's very comprehensible, and I see that uh, there are trends to do that in Ukraine as well. But I, I think we are uh, one of the consequences of, of this war is that this victimhood narrative, which was in, in our history, in our, in our memory, is uh, is kind of complemented with the warrior. Narrative. I, I don't want to call it a like hero narrative because it's maybe too pathetic, but just the idea, as you said, that this should be active effort. But coming back to Europe, because the title of our conversation is Does Europe Have Courage to Oppose the New Dictatorship? And uh, we also discussed this yesterday with, with the Dutch colleagues, and uh, there is a common, common feeling that this idea uh, that you should fight is lacking in today's Europe. So you, do, you don't find you don't find it anymore. Uh, you, you you rather uh, an average European citizen rather considers freedom as a kind of commodity that he or she buys in the supermarket and complains when this commodity is not of high quality. You know? um, do you have this impression, or maybe I'm too pessimistic because? Uh, we depend on Europe, we depend on America, uh, we depend on, on this feeling, that, uh, on this action as a, as, a, as a common fight. And now we see the very practical consequences of the fact that this feeling is not so widespread. So Europe behaved better than I thought. You know, on February 24th or 25th, I thought that all of governments would lie down before Putin and say, oh, my big are. It's not good what you're doing, but you don't protest at all. In fact, no, that's not what happened. And in a way, it's a good sign. And, um, and so Europe didn't buy the blackmail of uh, Ukraine and Nazi. You know, when Putin said that, nobody took it seriously. Unlike what had done France in 1992 with the Croats, what they call the Mustachi, which means collabor uh, collaborationist with the Nazi. But, um, uh, the first year was good. I will speak maybe later with the HD 
edition of Emmanuel Macron, which is like, you know, oscillating. Uh, but now, uh, you know, why are the Ukrainians uh, so worried? Because if the Congress doesn't vote this uh, envelope of 60 billion uh, dollars, there will be no takeover by Europe. Because Europe is divided, Europe uh, doesn't know exactly what she has to do. Uh, Hungary is blocking the, the process. And um, so the, the support of Europe is soft. It's a soft support. It's not an unconditional support, except for the countries which have suffered under the Soviet yoke, Baltic countries, uh, um, Bulgaria, Romania, and, uh, and Poland. Even if there are some uh, discrepancies. But uh, for the others, especially for the French, you know, they look at the results, and as you say, they consider the support like, like a, consumer, a consumer good. They say, okay, we've been waiting one year, they have all the time to, to win, now it's a second year, uh, how long that will, will that last? And uh, we are a little tired by this war, could we shift to another subject? And uh, we, we, we have that consumers, because what characterizes a consumer, it is impatience. Consumers have no patience, you know, they want one good now, they want another commodity there, and if you don't find it, okay, they won't come back. They go to another shop. And um, I think the main uh, quality that we lack is perseverance. We don't know what it is to support a cause for 5, 10, 20 years. As my generation did know, but uh, it seems that today the childish citizen of Western Europe was immediate results, like on his cell phone. So it's a paradox that uh, you know, Europe has come through the criticism of ideologies, the criticism of Marxism, the criticism of right-wing ideologies. But what you're saying is that there is no persistence right now. And in a, in a way, it's, it's went too far. It's went to this ideological relativism when you don't consider ideas as worth, you know, fighting for and struggling for. And it's an important thing that probably it went too much. And another thing is that, well, the as probably always, the, the, the good things about something also produce the bad things. For example, take the welfare state of the European countries like France and Germany. On the one hand, it's very good because it protects citizen from the unemployment, from health problems, etc. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it reduces the level of responsibility. It tells citizen, well, the state will take care of you. You don't have to do anything. You, you will be always protected. You take your security for granted. You take your health for granted. And it, it, it develops a kind of a continuous attitude to the idea of the nation or the community. Yes, exactly, and it makes a uh, citizen capricious. Whimsical, you know, you have whims, one day you want this, the other day you want something different, and of course very selfish. Because if you say to the French, we have, I think, between 100,000 and 200,000 Ukrainian refugees, and added to uh, people from the Middle East, from uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, people say, my God, it's very costly. Why should I give uh, so much money for the welfare state that doesn't help me so much? So there's a great part of selfish, selfishness, and there is no awareness of the danger. You know, they think that if Putin has not sent a rocket in Paris or on Limoges, that means that he's not so dangerous, that he's been very exaggerated. And I don't even speak of the pro-Putin camp in France, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, La France Insoumise, the extreme left, and a few philosophers like Luc Ferry, who uh, lost Putin to an uh, unreasonable point for whatever um, cause I don't understand. But anyway, but, uh, uh, it's, it's very sad. It, it's very sad in a way. And we would need, for this, we would need a strong leader. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I cannot say that Macron is a strong leader. Because remember what he said at the beginning. Uh, this year we went to see Macron in the Elysee with some friends about Armenia to protect Armenia from, the, from uh, Azerbaijan. And at the end of the conversation, Macron said, do you realize 
Putin swore me that he would never invade Ukraine, that he had nothing to do with the Wagner militia, and that he was a totally peaceful man, and he lied to me. How can you understand that? Well, who, who would dare to do that? And I quoted Sergei Nissin. They lie, we know they lie, they know that we know that they lie, they keep lying. This is the old Russian tradition, enhanced by uh, communism, but uh, Russia is the is is empire of the lies. And Macron has been very naive, and more than naive, he's been complicit because in a, you, you may be remember in 2019, uh, invited uh, Vladimir Putin Brégançon, which is a nice residence on uh, the seaside in, in, uh, near Nice, to, uh, to discuss the European architecture of security. So, you know, you have, uh, you have ducks, hens, chickens, and so you invite the world, say, what would you like to take, to take for, for today's lunch? Hens, chicken, or maybe you want a, a mix of them? And um, it, it was totally insane and, and blind. So Macron, it took him a year to change, and you know that the Russians and the Ukrainians invented the world, which said to Macronize, to Macronize said to speak, to, to say anything, and to change shift uh, every day. But in the end, uh, Emmanuel Macron, after a strong embrace and hug to Zelensky, who was almost embarrassed by the demonstration of affection, uh, decided to help Ukraine, which is good. So now, I think he will hold to, the, to this um, backup, and he will not change his mind once, once more again. But it's been very long. And um, this, is, this is Europe. The, the Europe oscillates from uh, indifference to complicity, and it is very sad. Maybe my last question, and I will give the floor to the audience to ask your questions. Um, I think that, uh, that that's the key question of today's conversation. Does Europe have the courage to oppose to new dictatorships? And uh, I think the reality right now is that Europe has understood the half of the truth. And the half of the truth is that, okay, Russia is evil, except for some people like Le Pen and Mélenchon and some others, which are still there. But still, majority of people understand it, I hope, at least that we, we see on the public opinion polls in the European Union. But why it is half of the truth? Because the other half is that you have to, you are endangered. You understand that you're endangered and you have to fight back. And this Europe, I think, does not, does not understand. It still thinks that it's stronger than Russia, and uh, Russia is weak, and Russia will not attack, and uh, you should not do anything about it, and you could still you know, have a conversation, have a dialogue, etc. Well, I think that Europe should look at Ukraine and understand that its destiny in the 21st century is precisely to be Ukraine, but on a bigger scale. What I mean, to be an endangered democracy. Because 21st century is not the end of history in Fukuyama's terms, but the end of history in, um, I don't know, fascist terms, you know. So the end of history in the sense that there are autocracies and dictatorships which actually enlarge and say the only truth is our truth, is that you have to have vertical of power, violence, etc. So do you think that Europe will wake up to this idea and understand that it should be a Republican, in an in a old sense of the word, a democratic fortress against this ocean of new dictatorships. So Europe has taken a very strong sleeping pill in 1989. Very strong, very... Uh, um, that could kill a, a person in good health. And uh, sometimes it has uh, moments of, uh, of uh, wake, up, wake up call. Oh my God, what is it? What's happening? Uh, revolution there, um, ISIS there, here. But, and, um, and the invasion of Ukraine has acted as a wake-up call. But as you say, it's a hard wake-up call. And um, the, the Europeans don't want any war. They want peace, quietness, a uh, nice space to, to spend their holidays, retirement, early retirement pensions. As we know, we have but for the terrible battle in France. This year, against uh, the retirement at 64, which was a scandal for every Frenchman. How dare you? When everybody elsewhere in Europe works until 65 or 67. It was like a, 
revolution, or like the resistance against Nazism, we saw thousands and thousands of French taking to the street and protesting to, uh, against this law, which was just a uh, basic and rational law. You live longer, you walk longer. But, uh, and so those small ambitions of the democratic individual, which had been very well underlined by the I see the topin. You know, the, the democratic individual doesn't, doesn't see further than his own interests and his own family and his own friends. We still there more than ever, especially when the outside world is dangerous. So Ukraine, okay, the first week, the first month, okay, let's go, yes, we have to have them. But now, almost two years after, there is no progress, has been a huge progress, but now the situation is blocked. Uh, is it really necessary to go further? And then the prophets of uh, bad advice are still on the, uh, on the run. You, know, you still hear them. Uh, Dominique de Vipin, Hubert Bedrin. Oh, we have to remember that Hubert Bedrin, who was a foreign uh, uh, minister uh, with Mitterrand, said that the war in Ukraine has been caused by the aggressivity of uh, the US against Russia. And of course, it doesn't. Uh, he doesn't stand, this is not true. This man doesn't know his history, but anyway, as he's a foreign minister, people say, oh, he knows a lot of things, maybe we've been too bad. And this is typical of a Western attitude. We, we are unable to recognize our enemies. Putin said, I'm going to revenge myself of the fall of the war in 1989. Uh, the Mollahs in Iran said, we are going to destroy this uh, perverse and disgusting Western world who gave, uh, that gives right to the gays and lesbians. Uh, Daesh and ISIS and, and Al Qaeda say we are going to destroy this disgusting Western world. So everybody speaks openly about their intention, and the Westerners say, oh, "Excuse me, no, no, you must, no, no, you've been mistaken. No, it's just a rhetoric. No, no, that's not at all what it means." And um, in France, we could have understood very early that Putin was our enemy because he, um, he tried to arouse the population in sub-Saharan Africa against France. And we lost four states which fell into the hands of the Latin militia. Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Niger, and South Africa. And Macron, during that time, he didn't say anything. He was blind by Russian friends. My good Russian friends, no, they cannot do that, no, it's impossible. And, and there is another reason also to the Western blindness. We have a romantic view of uh, Russia. Russia, it's uh, uh, Pushkin, sorry, uh, Tolstoy, Rachmaninov, um, Shostakovich, Tchaikovsky, the, the large fields of snow. Uh, ravishing brown girls welcoming you at the airport with little flag, and this this dates back to uh, this dates back to the 18th century. And the first victim of this propaganda were in fact Voltaire and you know, The only guy who really knew Russia very well is uh, Le Marquis de Pustin, who is the equivalent for Russia of uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. My favorite book. Yes, yes. For, uh, for America. So what was said about it, Christine? First, he's enthusiastic and says, what is this society? It's a, so a, it's a society of prisons. And he writes in his, in his letters, he writes, Russia is the greatest prison on earth, and the Tsar is just one prisoner among others, but with more titles. And it's exactly what we see nowadays. <coughs> Not very different. What Christine also said is that uh, the biggest aristocrat in Russia is the same slave for the Tsar as the lowest uh, slave. And we see right now the situation with the Russian oligarchs who are actually nothing, who are just slaves of, of the Tsar. Maybe last, last question what gives you hope in this gloomy situation? Well, you, you remember the, the, the song by the Beatles, I heard the new to the old boy? which was written in 1966. The new Sudan is not good. You cannot deny it. But it's not desperate. I think uh, Biden will finally succeed in uh, 
deciding the Congress to vote the grains for Ukraine. So he has to give up a few, to give a few concessions to the Republicans for the immigrants, and I think he can do that. Since the situation in Ukraine is more important than the situation of Mexican immigrants at the border. Rio Grande uh, border, even if it's important, of course. Um, but we shouldn't be worried. You know, uh, there should be a, a kind of automatic switch between Europe and the United States. The United States could say to Europe, this year we can't uh, give money to the Ukrainian, can you take over? And it would be very easy. But in Europe we have people like Orban, like the Prime Minister of Slovakia, and uh, they want to attack uh, get filters, I think you have talked about him yesterday, who want to block the credit and who want to give Ukraine to Russia. And um, so it's a difficult situation, but in, in your case, failure is not an option. You cannot afford to, to fail. You have to win one, at whatever cost. And when we talk about Orban all the time, I just think, okay, come on, but Orban is not Hitler, okay? And uh, Tito is not a powerful man as well. So it's, it's also a kind of, you know, hypocrisy to say, oh, this is all about Orban. Do something with him, finally. Okay, guys, uh, I open the floor to discussion and questions. Oh, let's see. Yes, I know. I knew that you will be there. So I have been time for this, uh, this time. Uh, you know, when you describe the contemporary Europeans uh, who live in a consumer society, your description sounds very close to the description of the last man, but not so much in Fukuyama's, but in Nietzsche's vision. They live a comfortable life. They are happy, moderately, and they have completely lost this ethos of work. On the other hand, people like Putin share with Zaratustra at least one similar feature, that is they have not the slightest pity to this last man. So on the one hand, we have the community of civilized last men, on the other hand, we have characters like Putin, Trump, Orban, Tisa, who resemble the opposite uh, side, Zaratustra. Uh, now, going beyond Putin and beyond Trump, do you believe that this is a, not just an end, but the dead end of human history, this opposition? And if not, what is the way beyond this opposition? Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a a book which was published in the 90s by Benjamin Barber called uh, Consumer Humanity. But uh, no, I don't think there was any end to the human history for the moment. But it might be the head of our comfort. And, um, but I don't think, um, for, for first, Trump is not Putin. He doesn't kill as many people as he did. He killed a few, like. Uh, I think that uh, the Iranian general, which was right to suppress in that youth, so, so I think it's similar to that where go. But um, he hasn't used so many people, and he's not a warrior. He wants to avoid war to America. He's an Israelis. Uh, Orban doesn't want war either. He wants to make trade with, uh, with uh, Putin and with China and with uh, autocracies. I left Orban in, uh, I think, 1990 in, uh, in Slovakia. He was at this time a handsome guy, uh, not as he has turned now, a little uh, plump. And he was extremely bright. I know his ambition was to slam the door to that fucking 20th century. That was exactly his work, which was a good, a, a good intention. So uh, Orban uh, fought against communi communism, and then he became a communist. Uh, you know, he prohibits uh, free press, he bans the uh, court of justice. So uh, he has turned into his own enemy, and that is very strange. And of course, I don't speak about people like 
Marine Le Pen was never been in power, and other uh, minor leaders of the far right of Europe. Again, the leader was just kept off uh, Donald Trump is outside of the hair, but for the world that's all he has. But um, those, those people are just protesters. And this is the main difference with Putin. Putin is very dangerous because he, because he means business. He means business. When he wants to suppress you, you better watch your, your, your shoulder because there will be someone behind you to push you into the river by minus 20. And, um, and so it's a, it's a new kind of leader to which we are not used in Europe. We, we are always looking for an accommodation, always looking for a compromise. If we're nice to them, they will be nice to them, to us. So maybe did I upset him or did I say anything against Islam or radical Islam? Did I say anything about uh, uh, your Russian crimes? Oh my God, I should have not. Uh, Russian army is perfect. It's a, it's a totally democratic army. And um, so we don't want to upset our enemy. We, uh, we fear them. And fear is a very, very bad advisor. It is the worst leader in the political field. And the, the public opinions in Europe are tetanized by fear, in my opinion. We fear everything, well, global warming, catastrophe, rain, snow, sun, summer, winter, kids' kids, uh, toys, cars. It's only one subject we're not afraid about. One, just one. Coal, of course, uh, nuclear power. For, uh, in, uh, Europe sometimes has turned into a, a Chinese nursery. And America too. America too. Uh, in, in 2015, uh, Barack Obama made a conference in uh, an American university and said, I said to the student, it was the beginning of the book movement, and said, we teachers and, and deans cannot be your tutors. We cannot be your, uh, your, uh, your nurses. Your grown-up adults you are going to lead America, please be here as adults. And, um, but obviously, his advice has not been listened to. So there are two, two people who can be called martyr people, martyr nations, the Jews and the Ukrainians. And uh, uh, the question is whether the world, the Western world, is ready to accept that there is this martyrdom of Ukrainians and whether it is also ready to accept that this transformation from the martyrdom to winners for both nations. Yeah, so many discussion nowadays in, in France how to say that Ukraine is well and the Gaza battle. So, um, but you know, on TV, on TV and on radio, we only listen to the point of view of a minority, a leftist minority. They say it's horrible what happens in Gaza. Israel is committing war crimes, we must stop all these. And the NGOs, especially uh, Red Cross and others, and Amnesty International say we have to stop Israel. Israel is committing a lot of genocide after Hitler against the Palestinians. And this is, of course, a very old rhetoric, which has been issued for the first time in 1975 by the UN. And uh, saying that uh, the Israelis have been persecuted by the Nazis, and they then turned into Nazis. Uh, 
which is a country in the United Kingdom. This one comes from every state. And um, may I put a little bit, but um, I think the resemblance with the Nazi regime is it's far from correct. And uh, it's typical of this transformation of the ex victim into a new executioner. Which is another topic of my book. Sorry to, to, to speak about this. But um, you've been oppressed by the Nazis, so you turn inevitably into a new Nazi. And uh, we know how much, uh, of course, the Gaza population is suffering a lot. And, um, but we know how the Israelis try to spare children and mothers. And the Hamas is uh, protecting itself uh, by the population as a human shield uh, against the Israeli bombs. Because the Hamas has no respect at all for, for uh, human life. Its own uh, population is just uh, means meat to be butchered by, uh, um, by uh, outside uh, bombs. And, uh, but uh, it seems to be uh, difficult to understand for many people on the left, on the extreme left and on the extreme right. But there was a, a poll today. Today is a very interesting day, but you were right to invite me. A poll uh, published by the Figaro. Almost 70% of the French, French public opinion supports uh, the, the action of the of Tzahal, the Israeli army, in Gaza. Because they think uh, that um, Israel is not fighting only for Israel, but it's fighting for the whole of Europe, exactly as you said, that Ukraine is not fighting only for Ukraine, but for the benefit of, of, of Europe. And um, whatever sympathy may attract uh, the Palestinian cause, uh, we cannot forget uh, November 13th, when 120 French people were killed by uh, ISIS in the name of the Almighty God. And uh, hearing uh, the Hamas uh, militants screaming Allah Akbar, personally, I don't want that. I don't want that. We heard it too many times in France, and then it prevailed to mass massacres, to killings, to stabbings. So uh, change your motto, change your sacred text. But Allah Akbar, when I hear that, I take my, my, my girlfriend, my kid, and I, and I run. Because I know I deal with a crazy guy. Or a crazy lady. And um, this explains why, uh, you know, in a way, we, we are closer to, uh, in reason of the recent events, we're closer uh, to, to some uh, uh, Israeli um, factors because we have uh, six to seven million Muslims in France. They know that many of them, most of them are not ready, but a few of them are ready to take to the jihad. And this is quite um, scary, quite unpleasant. You know, you take the third way or you're playing the part with your kid, and then uh, a, a lunatic comes and in the, in the name of his God, he thinks he has to cut your throat. Well, um, personally, I don't agree. I don't think it's, it's fair. I mean, at least the Russians are more, I don't know, I don't know there's no degree in, in, in violence. But um, anyway. That explains why uh, uh, the, the majority of the French population is rather uh, supporting Israel and Ukraine. More questions? Yes. Some of us focus kind of visited Kiev to share this time in this house. You mentioned about the global warming. Uh, your opinion, can uh, the uh, climate agenda uh, mobilize uh, intellectual um, as other people in the West uh, to oppose uh, the populist and uh, autocracy because the autocrat and populist is first of all beat uh, uh, the, cl uh, the climate uh, like, uh, green, green transition because uh, who is uh, first of all attack uh, this, uh, this idea is populist or uh, country like like China who want to grow beyond the uh, ethic uh, ethic uh, ethic for the camp. This, uh, if, if uh, Ukraine uh, cannot mobilize camp, this is idea because it's really dangerous for entire entire world. 
Well, the most, uh, the strongest, uh, the stronger agent of uh, climate change is the war. When you see those fields, those forests totally devastated in Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, or in the other parts of the country, it's not good for the climate. The fields are being erased, the ground is dead, the soil can, can, will not grow new uh, harvests before long. So the first enemy of uh, of uh, the fight against uh, climate watch is uh, first of all uh, uh, the war. And uh, I think I have been a little showered by green militants when I saw that, um, um, what's her name, this young lady, Greta Thunberg, they decided to wave the Palestinian flag and uh, to say that uh, she wanted to side along with Palestinians, which nowadays means to side along with Hamas. So I would like to know what she thinks about mass rape in, in South in Israel, um, uh, tearing down into pieces of young girls or babies. Is that the world she wishes to, to, uh, for, for a bright future? Or does she think that the Zionist um, octopus is destroying the planet? And I have to say that uh, all the leftist women are very divided nowadays on this issue. Uh, even much more than uh, about Ukraine, and um, this is quite concerning. Evening. Uh, just first of all, I'd like to say thank you just for this great experience because actually, um, personally, I'm just studying for my like, PhD in philosophy, and for us, for well, I guess for all of us, just great experience. Because what uh, what I can see now it's, it reminds me like you know uh, debates uh, between like uh, Foucault and Chomsky like back in the and I guess it just around to the same level. So I think it was, uh, yeah, yeah, Paul done this blog this uh, so probably yeah. Uh, so thank you for just uh, in the bottom of my heart just uh, amazing experience. So I'll try to like uh, make up a question a little more like philosophical. Uh, uh, how can we uh, just protect ourselves and Ukraine as well from dictators and dictatorships? Uh, do, uh, because we've been discussing also like, consumerism and consumer culture uh, is part of the body uh, and uh, so consumer culture creates hyper reality with simulations, postures like postmodernistic epoch and so on. And um, I'm just wondering what, what do you think? So. As if we uh, try to get rid of, to kill hyper reality, and we can actually protect ourselves from dictatorships. And so we must kill hyper reality, post truth, cancel culture, and um, actually post modernistic society, post modernistic people. So that's uh, my question. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, I think all those uh, issues are very interesting. As long as we're in peace, to uh, post modernism, uh, Wokeism or cancel culture, about the fact that women are oppressed because they are women, and all that all men are oppressed because they are men, because a man has a tool or weapon called the penis which forces him to be violent one way or the Even when the lady says yes, the man is a rapist. So, all those debates are very uh, exciting, but you know, in the cozy uh, atmosphere of a wonderful campus in Western Europe or in the United States. In times of war, war, you don't want to discuss those issues because it's a matter of life and death. So do you defend your country? Do you take to arms? Or do you, uh, or do you wait? Do you cross your arm and say, I don't want to engage myself because I don't want to participate to this uh, uh, compromised world, to this rotten uh, society, capitalistic society? And um, many of the debates we have in France, but also in the Netherlands, in Germany, remind me of this uh, legend. I don't know if it's true, but uh, it was a legend uh, told many times when the Ottomans were uh, on the gates of Constantinople in 14 something. Um, the, the king, Basileus, the king of, uh, of uh, Constantinople, was discussing about the sex of the angels. I don't know if it's true, but it's a nice example. It was strong debate, heated debates. And, uh, and finally, the, the Ottomans were consigned to what they keep them home or to them to, uh, to captivity and save the ladies. And the sex of the angels uh, turned into a total defeat. 
So many of these uh, philosophical theories which we debate about are pure um, epiphenomena and that don't seem to me very interesting to, to discuss about. I think we have to go back to the basics, which is for me the anti-totalitarian uh, thinking. Thank you. It really resonates with us, yeah, the, the way how you look at it. More questions? You can. You can. have all my time. Peter? No. Martin? I think that the best end of all the discussion the sex of the angel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Because on Saturday, Lachan was here uh, singing a song of massive attack, You Are My Angel. <laughs> but he forgot to add what a sex this angel had. More questions, guys? Okay, if there is no question, let me thank you wholeheartedly, Pascal, for this, uh, for coming, first of all, to Ukraine and uh, for this conversation. Thank you. It was very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.